and happy new year. You guys are one week into the new year. Did you know that? You're one week in, one down, and you have 51 to go. Is that right? So how are you doing? Have you started off well? Have you started off accomplishing your goals for the new year? Um, do you have any goals for the new year? Now, many of you were here last week when we started off the new year by having church on New Year's Eve day, which was really kind of cool. And I asked how many of you had resolutions? How many of you were resolving to do something? Uh, how many of you made decisions to do something different this year? Uh, and uh, I was interested to see how many of you raised your hands. So I just wanna ask you again, just because there's some here who, who weren't in another service, I asked the same question. How many of you have made decisions this year, resolutions to be different this year than last year? Anybody made a decision? Okay. Um, that's good. That's actually more than first service. You guys are much more spiritual than they, I'm sure, much more disciplined and committed. Um, but uh, when I ask you how many of you want to be different next year, how many of you want to have softer hearts, to have more meaningful lives, to have more purpose in the things that you do? How many of you want to be able to look back at the way you spend your days without regret? Um, how many of you want to grow this year? I think most of us would raise our hands. Now, the same number of people who raise their hands about wanting to grow and wanting to live our lives with purpose should also be the ones who raise their hands saying, I've made decisions to take steps in my life to accomplish those purposes because life is all about moving forward. And so I hope you've made some resolutions. If you haven't, I hope you'll consider today making a resolution because the message today in Hebrews 12 is all about living for Jesus, starting again. The author of Hebrews was writing to a Jewish crowd who had become Christians. Some of them were devoted Christians. Some were sort of mentally in, but not 100% decided whether they were gonna follow Christ. And then some were probably not really Christians at all, but were still very much Jewish and legalistic and kind of in it to sort of ruin it. A very diverse crowd hearing this message. But the intent of the author of Hebrews was to encourage us in our faith and say, don't get tired, don't become complacent, don't get bored. Remember why you became a Christian in the first place. Run with purpose. And this analogy of run is used in Hebrews. And it's also used by the Apostle Paul in a couple of really key locations. And we're going to develop this theme over the next couple of weeks. Now, you guys know that I told you last week that I intended to speak on Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, all in one week. There's four real simple points. One is to look back at the saints who've gone before. Number two, to throw off the weight that hinders us. Number three, to get rid of sin in our life that trips us up. And number four, to focus on Jesus. And I had so much fun last week that I spent the entire week on the introduction where we talked about looking back. And so I want us to look back to last week, just in case you weren't here, so that you can understand where we came from, but we're going to do it quickly. And then we are going to, in fact, move forward. So if you will, will with me, let's look back at Hebrews 12, verse one. Are you ready? Let's look together. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance, the race marked out before us, <coughs> excuse me, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Now, it may not sound like a New Year's resolution kind of a sermon or kind of a message, but it really is. Before we get into the word, I wanna take you to Forbes Health Research and just kind of put some context in and around what we are trying to do together just based on research from just random Americans. Uh, maybe they didn't interview any or poll any um, Midwesterners. I don't know, it may not be your experience, but at least this is supposed to be a random polling of America about people who start the year with great intentions and... Um, don't always end up accomplishing that purpose. Interesting facts. I hope you follow along. 62% of people make resolutions. 62%. I would say that's probably consistent with the number of you who raised your hands in here. I would say in first service, maybe 30%. It's an earlier service. They're a little more tired. The coffee hadn't had time to kick in. We'll give them a little bit of slack, a little extra credit there and think maybe some meant to raise their hands. Maybe I'd moved on to the next point and their hands were still coming up. I don't know. But let's just say for argument's sake that we're statistically similar and 62% make resolutions. 
Of those who made resolutions, many of them said they were coerced or forced into making resolutions by someone else. Now, how do you force somebody into making resolutions? I think I peer pressure my wife into making resolutions. Um, I don't really mean to, but I just sit there and stare at her until she tells me what her resolutions are. And uh, I think she just gives me resolutions just so that I leave her alone. And I love, I mean, I absolutely love looking back over the last year, putting a period at the end of that sentence, starting the new year fresh, deciding how we're going to be different, making decisions in life in three key areas, particularly. And I hope you consider making resolutions in each of these areas. Number one is spiritual. Number two is relational and your relationships with the closest people to you, whether it's a spouse, a child, whether it's a friend, whether it's your coworkers. And number three is physical because all three things go hand in hand and discipline across a person's life is important for balance. So I don't wanna coerce you into making any resolutions. I don't want you to say, yes, I'm going to resolve to grow in my relationship with Christ because you think that's what I wanna hear. I want you to say it because you know that's what you wanna do and you wanna be a different person at the end of the year than you are right now. Now, we know that some felt coerced. 48% of the population, when they did talk about their resolutions, wanted to lose a little weight and uh, get in shape. Now, that's something that most of us want to, to do. We wanna get in better shape. And you know, that's kind of a common and easy one to, to throw out there. Well, what would you like to do this year? Well, I'd like to lose a few pounds. You can always tell the person who's serious about their resolution by whether they start on January 1 or January 2. For the person who says, I'm gonna get in shape this year and I'm really gonna lose a lot of weight, um, but I'm not gonna start until after January 1st because January 1st, I'm blowing it out with snacks and I'm not doing anything. And then it becomes January 2nd and it becomes January 3rd. And then I'm gonna start next week. Then I'm gonna start next month and it's March and we're gonna have some March resolutions. And you know we can procrastinate like crazy and, and it, it just happens. But 48% of the people go physical. I want 100% of us to go physical, relational, and spiritual, all three, particularly spiritually. 20% of the people who seek resolutions or make resolutions ask for accountability. You know what accountability is? Asking somebody else to help you accomplish your goals. Now, only 20% ask somebody or tell somebody that they're gonna do it, they go public with it. And when you go public with it, you're responsible for it. One of my resolutions this year was to be a better father to my adult kids and to my daughter-in-law. Now, I don't think I was a bad father this last year. I work really hard on it, but I wanna be better because I wanna help influence them. I wanna be more positive. I wanna be more optimistic and I wanna be encouraging. And, I, and, and so instead of just saying that in my own you know, mind, that's an intention, I said it to them. Now I'm accountable because they know. So when I mess up, they're like, there's dad not keeping his resolution, right? And at the end of the year, I can ask him, I can say, how did I do? This is what I was trying to do, but I had to, I had to put steps in my life to make sure that it happens. And for me, it involves a process of calendaring and reminders and stuff. We can talk about that later, but I, I held myself accountable. And now some people blame accountability. They say, I didn't keep my resolution because you didn't make me and I asked for your help. And so it's your fault. And we can hide behind that accountability. But finally, the sad reality is that of the people interviewed or polled, according to Forbes Health, only 1% at the end of the year of the population who made a resolution, a decision to change, who said they were gonna take action steps, only 1% follow through. Only a handful of hands out of all of the hands that went up will be successful if you are statistically consistent, but you have a superpower you have a secret weapon. The Holy Spirit of God lives within you and will give you the desire and the ability to change and transform and to crush the odds because it's what he does. Romans 12 says, don't be conformed to the plan the world has for you, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds because God will change the way you think and the way you live. What I want from you today is I want for you to latch on to something that I'm going to give you, a principle that's so simple and so important. And it'll feel like you're giving something up, but in reality, you're getting something you could never get for yourself. And I'm gonna share that with you in a minute, but I wanna take you back right now and just remind you who these hall of witnesses were in Hebrews chapter 12, verse one. 
Hebrews chapter 12, verse one, the apostle Paul is talking about all of the great Christians or saints who've gone before us. He, I'm sorry, the writer of Hebrews, I get confused sometimes because Paul wrote most of the New Testament and sometimes I just attribute it to Paul. We don't know who wrote Hebrews. We know he was Jewish. We know he was writing to Jewish Christians. The author of Hebrews was uh, talking about all of the saints that were talked about in the Old Testament, all of the Old Testament greats, the, the faithful in the Old Testament. He was talking about Noah. He was talking about Abraham and Isaac. Isaac and Jacob and Moses. And, and he was talking about David and even talking about, you know, other people who along the way maybe hadn't been mentioned in scripture. And for you, you have some greats in your life who maybe you've known who've been faithful in their lives, who've undergone adversity, who have remained faithful and whose lives are not perfect. But when they died, they went on to heaven and they saw Jesus and they heard the words, you were good and you were faithful. Welcome home. And the author of Hebrews is saying, remember those people. And remember that as you run this race, it can be run. The image is of you running on a track. And the people who have died and gone before are not watching you run, but it's like their backs are to you, not because they're disinterested, but because they're looking at Jesus. There's no indication in scripture that all those who've died before us are standing in heaven, looking down and watching us live. Um, there is an indication that in certain circumstances, there are certain people who will know what's going on in a big picture from heaven to earth. But your grandma or your mom who's passed on is not up there watching you or watching over you. And it's a good thing because they have other stuff to do. Now they're waiting for you to finish, but they're looking at Jesus. And if they were looking at you, they would be disappointed from time to time, wouldn't they? It'd make them sad. Can you imagine grandma who's passed on is like, today's the day Rick's gonna get it right. And she's sitting there and she's waiting and she's cheering and Rick doesn't get it right. And she's like, ah, oh, there's no sadness in heaven. It's between you and Jesus. But it's like you are running on a track and all of those who've gone before who've had a relationship with God, those in the Old Testament who were faithful and after Jesus through Jesus Christ are standing there staring at Jesus. They're living their heavenly lives, but we are running knowing that they're there, realizing that there's something on the other side that's so much better than this side and that we're going to get there. And that's the great hall of witnesses. Hebrews tells us that what they've experienced isn't complete until we're done running and then we'll all experience it together. So in a sense, they're waiting for us to finish so that we can join them. But he's saying, remember all these people. Their lives weren't necessarily easy. Some of them faced fire like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Some of them faced lions like Daniel. Some of them faced the belly of a whale like Jonah. Some of them face loneliness like Abraham or depression like Elijah, but they finished well and you can finish well too. So he starts off with encouragement saying, you may not think you can, but you can do this. And then he lays the principle out that we're gonna talk about in just a few minutes. Are you ready to hear it? I'm not gonna develop it, we're gonna sing. I just wanna lay it out there for you so you know where we're heading. This is what he said. This is secret number one. This is how you're supposed to run this race, how you can make sure that you're not one of those people, the 99%, how you can be different and beat the odds. He says, let us throw off everything that hinders us. Now I've titled the message today, you're gonna lose some weight, right? You're gonna lose a few, resolve. Are you gonna lose a few? Now it may be a few that you wanna lose around the middle, but this literally is talking about the weight that we carry that keeps us from becoming the person who God has intended for us to become. He's talking about the past. The author of Hebrews is talking about freeing yourself from your past and allowing yourself to put a period at the end of the sentence of last year or the last years and begin again with a capital letter, a new page, a new chapter, allowing him to be the author and for you to experience things you've never experienced before because you're living for him in a different way.
In just a few minutes, we're going to talk about that. Before we do that, we're going to sing and I've asked some friends to come and stand here in the front if you guys want to come now. Um, Our prayer team, they'll be here for you during the time that we're singing our songs to the Lord. If you have a request that that you'd like to just have someone else pray for, pray with you over, a burden you're bearing for yourself or for someone else, something that you just like to share. These are people who I want to pray for me and and have prayed for me and and people who are just excited to be here for you. And so if you'd like to come share something with them uh, and pray, they'll be up here in the front during our singing. You're welcome to do that. There are also other ways for you to let us know things that are on your heart. You can write your request, your prayer request on the card in the seat back in front of you. You can drop those in the box. You can bring them up and hand them to one of us. You can submit one online. We have a team who meets every week and they pray for you and the things that are important to you. And so during this time of singing, as you respond to the Lord, they'll be here. We're here for you. And I'm going to come back in a few minutes and I'm going to talk about how we're going to shed a few, a few of the pounds that weigh you down from your past. So how many of you remember, uh, this is a scary thing when I ask how many remember uh, messages from week to week, because I know you've slept since then, but I'm going to go ahead and just risk it. The series that we did, the little mini series before Christmas that ended uh, the week before Christmas Eve on the tongue, on taming the tongue. Do you remember what this means? Quick to listen, slow to speak, right? Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry because human anger does not get along with or produce the kind of righteousness that that God desires. And on the last week we were together, I challenged you. Do you remember this? I said, pick three people out of your life two who are relatively easy to encourage, to speak um, truth into, to be positive, to tell them something that's going to uplift them. And one person in your life who's really difficult to encourage, uh, to speak truth to, and to uh, to, uh, speak something positive and uplifting into their lives, and to pray about what you're going to say, prepare it in advance, look for the right opportunity, and to present it to them. Now, does that ring a bell to anyone? Do you remember the the assignment, right, the the challenge? Um, Now, you don't have to raise your hands here, but I want to know how many of you did it over the holidays? Now, before you raise your hands and go, yeah, 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 I did, or don't, don't raise your hands and feel really bad about yourself, I ask our pastors and our staff this on Tuesdays. The results were mixed, okay? We had some who were ready to go, yeah, 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 I did it. And then one of them even said, you know, I think I might have done the opposite this Christmas. I may have, my mouth might have gotten me in trouble this Christmas. So, I mean, we experienced the exact same things you guys experience, of course, um, but I'm just wondering if you did it. Now, the reason I want to know is because what we do here, the reason that I'm up here, the reason that we're talking together is so that you can live differently. So that we can take the truths from the word of God and we can put them into our lives and we can go and do something so that God can help us grow and we can become different people. And if all we're doing is coming here and listening and receiving the word, that's great. That's that's the first part, but it's not enough. And so I'm wondering if you take these things with you and if you do them. Now, I want to ask you one question. And then I'm going to end it with another question in a few minutes. The first question is, are you willing to open your ears and your heart and receive this first clue, this first instruction, this first command from the author of Hebrews about how it is that we can run this Christian life, how we can put this period at the end of the sentence and begin to run new today and start a new chapter. Are you willing to listen to it? Are you, are you willing to open your ears and hear it? Give me this if you're willing. Okay, that's, that's what I want. I want us to be willing to hear. Now, willing to do will come in a little while after you realize how deep and personal it is. Here's the passage, part of the passage, super simple. The writer of Hebrews said, therefore, remember all those people who've gone before us, these Christians. And then he says, be ready to throw off anything that hinders us in our walk of faith. And the word hinder literally means weight. Be willing to throw off the weight that hinders us. Now I've titled the message today, gonna lose a few because on New Year's, day and around New Year's, people like to make those kinds of resolutions. But I want to know if you're willing to lose a few in the way the writer of Hebrews, the Holy Spirit intends for us to lose a few. Because when he says, are you willing to throw off the weight that hinders you? What he's talking about, and he was talking originally to these Jewish Christians, he was talking about the weight of their past. 
How many of you have weight that hinders you from your past? I raise my hand. You have to raise your hands. If you don't want to raise your hand, it's a big group. The room's full. No one's going to single you out. All of us have something from our past that we carry forward into the, to the future. In some cases, it, it creates an identity. In some cases, it continues to tell lies to us. And the writer of Hebrews is saying the very first thing you have to do is you have to be able to get rid of the weight of the past. My son, Nathan, my youngest, is getting ready to move from an apartment to a house. And the other day we were talking on the phone and he said, so, hey, dad, you're going to come help me move. Now, he lives seven and a half hours away and he has friends who are 25 ish and much you know, younger. And, you know, I, every time I help somebody move, I always say my moving days are over. Anybody ever said that? My moving days are over. I don't even have a truck. Right. I mean, if you've got a truck, you're kind of stuck. Right. You just you have to help people move. If you don't have a truck. You don't have to help them. But, you know, Nate's like, hey, you want to come help me move? And so, of course, mom and I are going to help, you know, help help out and try to get him, him settled. But I hate lifting stuff like that. I hate carrying couches. I hate it. I don't ever want to carry another couch in my life. You ever carried a couch up the stairs with a landing with railings and, you know, and, and you're the one in the front and you have to figure out whether you turn this and, and you're trying and you grab it. There's no handholds. You're just grabbing onto the fabric and you take the baby steps because you don't want to trip down the stairs and someone's pulling back and someone's pushing forward. And, and it's just, a, it's unbearable. And the author of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews is saying, we all have couches that are sitting on our shoulders that we're trying to carry down complicated flights of stairs that we call life. And it's time to throw them away. How good would it feel when you're carrying a couch up or down the stairs with somebody to say, get out of the way. I am going to ship this thing down the stairs and I don't care where it lands. Wouldn't that feel good? Not for the person who owns the couch, but for you. And that's what the author of Hebrews is saying to you. If you choose to, you can box up the bad and the good from the past, the weight that may be keeping you from moving into the future, and you can roll that thing down the stairs. But you have to want to. And some of you don't want to. Some of your successes in the past have defined you and you continue to live in days, months, weeks, years ago. Some of your bad experiences of the past have defined you and the pain and the anger and the sadness has become part of you and you're scared to release it to the Lord. And I want to talk to you about how to move past your past. Are you ready for that? Are you ready to, to, it's an acronym and it's super simple, but it's hard to do. I like acronyms because they speak to me. I can remember them. And this acronym is free, F-R-E-E. -E. Because when you are willing to move past your past, you can become free, but you have to choose to move past it. The sadness, the grief, the joy, the disappointment, all of it, it's in the past and you have a future. And as you run, each step propels you into the future. Now in this acronym free, I had two F's, two R's, two E's, two E's. And I had to choose which ones to give you because there's so many things I could talk to you about. And I've chosen one. And that's what we're going to talk about today. One word with each letter, F-R-E-E. -E. The first one you're going to love because we come back to it time and time again. Are you ready for the first one? The first one is the letter F and it's forgiveness. Now you, some of you turn me off right away and go, ah, there's the pastor talking about forgiveness again. But if you were to ask me, what is the number one way I could guarantee that you were stuck in your past? Do you know what that would be? What's the number one way that I can guarantee you're never going to move forward in life? What is the number one way that I can guarantee you that your relationships that you have and will have are going to be tainted and at some level dissatisfying? It's choosing to move into the future with unforgiveness in your past. And some of you aren't willing to forgive because you just want to be mad. And you're waiting to exact a debt from somebody that you're never going to exact and you may die bitter and hopefully not lonely, but full of regret. And in three real simple ideas sort of make up this concept for me, three sub points surrounding the F. And the first one is, is that I want you to forgive um, God. Now, 
just bear with me, track with me. It looks like I might be losing some of you. You're like, uh-uh, you've stepped into my business and so I'm stepping out of yours, pastor. I don't want you to step out yet. I ask you, remember, I ask you, are you willing to listen? And you all nodded your heads and said, yes, I'm holding you to your promise. I'll ask you to do it in a minute, but are you willing to listen? I want you to forgive God. What do you mean forgive God? God never does anything wrong. No, he doesn't, but we think he does sometimes because we try to play God. And there are things that have happened to you in your life that are bad things that you caused and you suffered consequences. And there are things in your life that are terrible things that have happened to you that you didn't cause and you suffer consequences. And there are prayers you prayed when God didn't answer those prayers the way you wanted him to. And you have become understandably disillusioned with God and angry and you're holding a little God grudge. And I get it. And in some cases, that's the hardest one to let go. Because by letting go, we have to say, God, your plan is perfect and I'm not. And I live in a world that's not perfect. And I've messed up and people have messed up and your plan isn't exactly what I expected or even what I would choose for myself, but you are God and I am not. And I'm gonna be at peace with that. Now that's a big one, isn't it? A big one. The second little sub point in the F for forgive is, am I gonna forgive others? People who've wronged you, doesn't mean what they did was right, doesn't mean that it was legal, doesn't mean there shouldn't be consequences, doesn't mean you should ever have a relationship with them again, but are you willing to let that offense go? To put it in a box and to ship it down the stairs? Are you just gonna hang on to it this next year? Because it's become part of who you are and it's comfortable and you don't wanna let it go. You feel, and it's normal, like if you forgive, you're going to say it's okay. And those aren't the same things. Are you tracking with me so far? Still listening? I'd like to say it's gonna get easier, but for a second, it's not. We're gonna go a little deeper and your shoes will get a little bit more scuffed up and then it'll be fine because we'll end it on a light, happy note. The third sub point of forgiveness is, am I willing to forgive myself? Because at the end of the day, we have disappointed ourselves time and time and time again. And failure, instead of being looked at as an event, can become an identity or a person. And we have to be willing to forgive ourselves. I believe in you. And I know you've been through some stuff. And I know that if I was just logical and looking at it from a human standpoint, then I may not have a whole lot of hope that you're gonna be in that groundbreaking 1%. But I have confidence in you and in the Lord Jesus Christ in you and in the power of the Holy Spirit that can live within you if you're a believer. And he, my friends, will break you free if you let him but he's not going to do it unless you let him. And you have to be willing to throw it on the couch, to put it in a box, to toss it down the stairs and say, God, it's yours. It's no longer mine. And that's the F in free. The R is religion. Now this really associates closely with what this original audience would have heard because they came from an abusive legalistic church where they were told they were never good enough and would never measure up and they were frustrated by it. Maybe some of you have had those experiences. Maybe you've had an abusive pastor or church body at some point that you didn't feel like you belonged in. Your life didn't feel clean enough. You didn't feel perfect enough. You were inundated by rules and regulations. You were confused because what wasn't really biblical seemed to be so important. And if that's your experience, I just wanna tell you, I'm sorry. And I may not have been the one who did it, but I'm part of the the church. And unfortunately, many of you have been wounded and you shouldn't have been because if you've been with us any period of time, you've studied the life of Jesus and you know he is different. And many times the people who say they speak for Jesus don't. And just like you don't wanna be judged by everybody who says they know you, don't judge him just because somebody did something to you saying that they knew him. You have to put your religious experiences behind you, even the good ones. 
Was there a time in your life when church was just so good and you were growing so fast and you just thought everything was great? And you know, if you could just get back there, if we could just go back to the way things were, it'd be all right. But things are never going back to the way things were. Do you know why? Because that was yesterday and as good as things used to be, they can't ever be that way. And when we try to force churches or families or friends or marriages into the past, all it does is trap them into an impossible standard that literally physically cannot be recreated. And we have to celebrate the good things and put a period at the end of that sentence and say, what comes next? It's not just in religion we have to do that with, it's in family. You remember when your kids were two and three and couldn't wait to run out and open Christmas presents? Well, when they're 30, they don't get quite as excited, right? You can't go back. You go forward because that's the way God has created us. So that's the R in free. E is excuses. You make excuses about why you're not going to put a period at the end of your sentence and move forward, and so do I. And listen to me, friends, excuses can look like reasons from a distance. And you and I have to ruthlessly eliminate excuses from our lives because excuses are your enemy. And what was true yesterday does not have to be true today. And by God's grace does not have to be true tomorrow. So whatever your excuse is, when I say to you, why wouldn't today be the day you begin to grow? Why wouldn't today be the day you put your past behind you? Whatever your excuse is, it looks like a reason from a distance, but I want you to scoot up close to it. Take a chair right next to it. Look it right in the face and say, you're not a reason at all. You're just an excuse. And I want you to put it in a box, take it to the top of the stairs, and I want you to toss that thing off, never to see it again. And the last E in the free acronym is in fact experiences because you carry with you and sometimes are the sum total of the experiences that you have had to this point in life. But every experience you have had is in the past. It's so non-profound, I hate to say it. I'll say it again. Every experience you've had is in the past except for the experience that you're having right now, which is in the present, which means that now is the only time you can react to the experience that you're having and resolve to move into the future as a different person. And it seems impossible, but my Bible tells me that God creates a new creature and that he has new experiences for us. Regret can be a powerful motivator to never let us fool with, experience, deal with the stuff that we've dealt with in the past, but we can never let it to be or let it become a, a paralyzer. The writer of Hebrews says the very first thing you have to do is you have to put off the weight that hinders you. So what is it that's hindering you from your past? And are you willing to give it to God? Do you resolve to give it to God? Because this is just the first of two things. Next week we talk about sin, which really again gets in our business. It's lots of fun because we examine our hearts, but today we're talking about the past. Are you ready to move beyond? I never can forget, but we can give it to the Lord. Are you ready with me to collectively wrap it up in a box, take it to the top of a large building, Go to the stairs and roll it down with a promise to never retrieve. What are your resolutions? Now, in general, the staff, the pastors and I, we have some resolutions for you guys. You don't know that probably. We don't call them resolutions, but it's the way that we judge whether or not we're a different church at the end of the year that we are at the beginning of the year, where you're, whether you're different then than you are now. And for us, we use a really simple metric. It's very, very simple. And the first one is what you're doing right now. You guys are, you guys are, you're here. You're here with us. You're watching, you're here, you're in the room. And I think it's so important. And as I told you last week, my goal for you is to be here every single week. 
unless you can't. And when I say can't, I mean can't, not won't. I've never been a normal person. That may not surprise you. But I have not just been, and when I say just, I don't mean in a pejorative way, but I have not just been a church attendee my entire life since I was in high school. I've been working in a church since 1989. That's a long time, which means I'm very pastory. And I don't know what your experience is like firsthand. And so I'm very slow to judge your experience because it's not been my experience. Many of our pastors are very pastory and I don't mean churchy, but I mean, you know, we don't judge your experience um, because we've never lived your experience. But I do look at my friends, see what motivates and drives you, see what encourages you, see what helps you grow. And I look at my kids and their friends. And this is what I see. That if they're not in church on Sunday, they're not growing during the week. Now you may say that's not true. And then I would say, great, you're an anomaly. You are one of the few. Your life may be full of spiritual discipline. You may draw near to the Lord on your own. But in general, consistently and over time, what I have observed in people closest to me is that if they don't make a discipline of being here consistently, then they're not growing in the Lord. And when I see my two-year-old granddaughter, what scares me more than anything else is that they're gonna make choices for her that she's not making for herself that are gonna keep her from being here. And I don't care if she's good at sports and everything else. I care if she's good at God. And when she's 30, nobody's gonna care what trophies are on her wall, but they are gonna care if she's a little woman after God's own heart. And the world has a plan for her and it is crashing in. And all this does is make a little space in their little lives, in our big lives, for God to slip in and for that transformation to take place. And it's a hard choice, but man, is it worth it. The second thing is not just being here, but it's showing God where our heart is, which is by giving. And it's easy for people to point fingers and accusations at pastors. Oh, you're just concerned about the money. What I'm concerned about is knowing where your heart is because as pastors, we look at our congregation and we try to see, are we growing? Are we growing in favor with God? Are we growing in relationship with one another? One of the metrics that Jesus used is he said, if you wanna know where a heart is, look at the wallet. And if a person is giving to the Lord, and the way we do that is through our local church, then the heart is after God. And so it's not really a problem with me you would have, it's a problem with Jesus you would have, and you would have to say, Jesus, I don't like your way. I don't agree with you. And then that's between you and him. I don't wanna be in that argument. I'll sit there and help, but I don't wanna be in the middle of it because Jesus has created us. And he wants to create in us the life that he wants us to have. And the third thing is, is that I want to see us serving. Because when you are sitting and consuming and taking in and man, you're feeling it and you're hearing it, and then you begin to demonstrate it. There's no way that we with our lives can't begin to live it by doing something for the people around us who can do nothing for us in return. And so one of the ways we as a pastoral staff, we gauge the progress of our church is those three, those three things. And it's not so that anyone can grow a kingdom. It's so that I know that we are growing as part of God's kingdom. But we're going to talk more about that next week and the week after. What I want to leave you with is this simple question and this simple challenge. What is it from your past the experiences that you've had, the decisions that you've made, the way you've chosen to live your life or the way someone else chose that your life would be living, lived. What is it from your past that today you were willing to put in a box, to take to the top of the stairs and to let go and let God have it so that he can put a period at the end of what in some cases is a really long sentence, not an ellipsis, but a period. And to begin a new chapter in your life with a capital letter where he's the author and you begin to run with purpose. That's what we're talking about. 
That's why I get so excited about it. And that's why I'm so glad you're here. Do not miss next week because next week we're going to build on this theme. The week after we're going to bring it home. And it's so much fun for us to do it together. Thank you for listening. That was my first question. My last question is what are you going to do about it? Father, thank you so much for the time we've spent. And I pray that it was time invested and I pray that the investment shows itself by yielding life change. It's easy to hear your words, easy to be stirred by your words. It's easy to acknowledge that we need to live differently, but so hard to actually do it. And my prayer for my friends right now is you would set them free, F-R-E-E, from the past that we together as a family would take each step boldly into the future with you as our leader, your Holy Spirit as our strength and your mission as our purpose. Because time is running out, our time and all of our time. And we want every day to count. I love my friends, Father, and I believe in them but you believe them in them and love them far more than I do. And we live in a world that sets itself up against this way of life. But you give us the power to overcome. So my prayer, Father, is that you set us free. And today, from this piece of this passage, freedom from the past. It's in the name of Jesus, I pray these things, amen.